Lord. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook tonight. God bless you. Uh, hope the Lord blesses you. And uh, we just have a couple of announcements. Uh, the worship schedule and children's schedule for the church is posted in the Sunday school area. So if you have any of those ministries, and they, that's what they are, they're ministries. They're not just um, babysitting. They're ministries. And what you impart to a child, uh, you never know what's, how much that seed that you sow in their hearts will grow later on in years, and they'll be thankful for it. So um, the schedule's back there. Also, don't forget to set your clocks back on Saturday. No? <laughs> you get an extra hour of sleep, so they say. But, I, but, but when it goes the other way, you lose an hour, so I think you just come back to even. You know, that's my way of looking at it. So don't forget, set your clocks back Saturday evening um, and um, be on church on time. Amen. Well, I want to thank those who filled in for me while I was gone. God bless you. Thank you for Wednesday night, and thank you for Sunday morning and, and all that God is doing. And we're glad to be back. Amen? Praise God. Well, if we're going to be studying, uh, interpreting the Scriptures, and we're going to be looking at some uh, different things tonight. Uh, so let's just open a word of prayer. Father, thank you for those who are watching, those that came out tonight. <clears throat> Lord, thank you that it was a quiet Halloween, that we had no visitors come to our home. Thank you. I thank you and praise you for that, Lord, because it's a high, holy, satanic day. And Lord, we don't, I don't participate in Halloween at all. And I thank you and praise you for the stand that many have taken, even in the time of ridicule and mocking. God, but we'll stand for righteousness, holiness, and truth. And so, Father, we ask that your blessing be upon this Bible study tonight, and that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we started talking about the different um, aspects of how to interpret the Bible, and we looked at the uh, different principles uh, in the last five chapters, we're going to be looking at the context principle today, and we're going to be looking at the qualification of that. Uh, pre evading all the interpretation must be utilization of the correct, uh, the context principle. And so we're going to look at that, that the um, conclusion we came to to this point after looking at different things is the literary method of uh, weaving together context used in writing scripture gives rise to the uh, context principle of interpreting the scriptures. And so therefore, because of that, we use the literary um, interpretation of Scripture, and we should. And there's times where you come across some allegories and some different kinds of things like that in the Scriptures and, and parables and, and things like that, and we'll get into some of that later on as we get into the study. But the qualification is uh, something we're going to look at tonight. And the fourfold aspect of the context must be consistently be considered and appropriate emphasis should be placed on each of these four. And so overemphasis of any one aspect will produce an imbalance in interpretation, creating the danger of overlooking the vast areas of truth. And so uh, tonight we're going to look in relation to the context principle. A verse should never be taken out of its setting and given a foreign meaning or meaning not implied in the passage. Uh, always remember that. What happens a lot of times is people will take a scripture, one particular scripture, and they'll tell you what they think it means. And so what we have to be careful of is that we don't make the scripture say something it doesn't say. And the important thing is it's not what you think the scripture says. Okay, it's what does the scripture say. And so that's the bottom line of what does the scripture say. And so we have to look at that, okay? And I'm going to give you an example, okay? If you look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, these verses have sometimes been interpreted to mean that a minister must never take any provision with him when traveling. Right? To provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> when I go to foreign lands, I take money with me. Okay? And you say, well, pastor, that's a violation of Scripture. No, it's not. 
because these verses must be interpreted in the light of their context. And always remember that. In the light of their context. Jesus was specifically commanding the 12 apostles for a specific mission. And if they are interpreted to refer to all Christian ministry, we would have to assume also that the ministry to the Gentiles and the Sumerians is forbidden. And only ministry to the house of Israel is permitted because that's what this context talks about. So you have to also take that into consideration when interpreting the scripture. Look at Luke 24, 49, for example. Luke 24, 49. Let's, let's read that scripture. Okay? And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. Now, if we were to take this uh, in its literal sense, in the, I would say, the ultra-literal sense, okay? If we took this, we would have to go to Jerusalem and tarry, right? That's what it says, tarry in Jerusalem until you be under power and high. Well, how do we know how to interpret that scripture? How do we know how to interpret that scripture? I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for feedback. Yes, Robert. Okay, that's very good. Yep, but what else? Yes, find out who he was talking to. Remember, these are all letters, and he was speaking. And Luke, who was he speaking to? And once you understand who he's speaking to, then you can also understand the application of that. Okay? When he said to tarry in Jerusalem till you be endured with power from on high, who was he speaking to? Hmm? His disciples. Okay. And if you go in the book of Acts and you see that they were all in the upper room, right? Was, there was, and let me, let me just say this, okay? The Bible's not clear on how many were in the upper room. I'm getting some faces. The Bible says there were about 100. It doesn't say there was 120. It says there was about. So that could be 118, 117, 119. There was about 120. They didn't have an exact number. We always put the exact number on it. It was 120 in the upper room. We don't really know that for a fact. So the context of that is that there's about 120 in the upper room. So we'll say there is about. We don't know the exact number. And uh, so we see the fulfillment of the scriptures that Jesus was talking to and who the people he was talking to. Now see, right now there is no, uh, there is an upper room in Jerusalem. We were in it. We were there. Okay, that they believe that was the site of where the Holy Spirit came and fell. But you don't go traveling to Jerusalem to tarry in the upper room waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because later on as we read further scripture, people that were Gentiles, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And so and they were... You know, some of them were through the laying on of hands. Others were not through the laying on of hands. They were just preaching the, the word, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and wherever they were. So you don't have to be in a specific place or a specific time to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that's the proper interpretation, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to go to Jerusalem and tarry there to get the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So in using the context principle, we must always allow the clear statement of Scripture to interpret the obscure. To reverse this order will cause confusion. For an example, in Psalm 115, verse 17, in comparing that with Ecclesiastes 9.5, you'll see that these obscure verses concerning the state of the dead must be interpreted in the light of Jesus' clear teachings in Luke 16, 19, and 31. So you, you have to use Scripture. Remember what we talked about? Scripture interpreting Scripture. The reason why we have so many people today giving so many interpretations, especially on television, and sometimes I, I just cringe because I hear these people, and I say, you know, come on. You guys, you're trying to promote an idea or a philosophy or a CD or whatever you're trying to sell or whatever you're trying to put together, and you're taking the Word of God out of context. 
<clears throat> I remember years ago, this was, <clears throat> this was years and years ago. Did somebody give me water? <clears throat> years and years ago, how many remember PTL? Right? Many of you remember PTL. <clears throat> and I was watching Jim Baker and Tammy Faye Baker on PTL. And it was a time that they were building this ministry. They were building PTL. and They were making it like a tourist attraction, almost like Disney World. And they were pouring into that millions and millions of dollars. <clears throat> and so one day they decided that what they were going to do for the kids is to have a train. And they were going to have this train go all the way throughout. Um, I forgot what they called it, but it was PTL, but there was a special name for it. I forgot what it was. All through PTL, this train was going to go there. And so Jim Baker came on television, and he said this, and I heard him. It's not something he say. I heard him say this. And he said, um, there's trains in the Bible. And he, what he was trying to do is justify what he was doing. He said, there's trains in the Bible, because Isaiah says his train filled the temple. Okay. Well, right then and there, when I heard that, I said, this is going to be part of the downfall of PTL. You can't take the glory of God and, and take it into a place of hum, a human interpretation like that and, and say that the, you know, his train filled the temple and that he was talking about a train that you, 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 go, you go on and to, and to validify that decision of putting a train in PTL. But so many people believe that. Are you hearing me? So many people believe that. And they were fooled by that. And where's PTL today? It's, it's gone. You know, I know that uh, Marcerillo's son has got it. And all, all it is is a, is a fundraising uh, ministry now. They very seldom talk about Jesus or the blood or sin or holiness or righteousness or confession of sin and getting right with God. It's all about sowing seed and, and you know, calling right now. And I, I was listening to Mike Murdoch the other day, and I, I was just shaking my head. I said, Man, every time I turn that on, there's always a campaign for money, 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 and sow the seed. And, and the window of 17, he says, the window of 17, if you call right now, these 17 promises will come to you. That's a bunch of baloney. But all this kind of stuff is going on in Christendom. You know, and I had a great conversation with two people today uh, um, that I was with. And uh, they were at, asking me about religion. We were talking about Wicca, and we were talking about Christianity. And, he, and the person was telling me, he says, you know, they're pretty much the same. And I said, well, no, they're not the same. I said, they can't be the same. And so I begin to instruct, you know, teach them and tell them different things. And, and I'm praying that, God, will you take that seed? And that's the kind of seed I want to plant. I don't want to just plant $1,000 and something, hope to get something back. I want to plant the seed of God's word in people's hearts and people's minds to get them to think about what they truly believe. And I asked them, I said, well, what is, what is, where is your blood sacrifice for your sins? And he couldn't answer me because they have none. And again, you know, I said, if we could get to heaven by our works, there would be no need for Jesus Christ to come and suffer and die for, on the cross for us. So taking things into context is the most important principle when you're interpreting the word of God. Otherwise, you can run off and make it say whatever you want to. You can make it say um, uh, God wants you to ri be rich or whatever. Um, another one that's very famous, you probably heard it uh, from the faith, hyper, I call them hyper-faith teachers on TV, is they'll tell you, you know, the Bible says you can say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and, and, the, and it will obey you. Well, most of the time, uh, when Jesus was using illustrations like this, um, you know, when he said, you'll say unto this mountain, he wasn't just speaking something. He was pointing to something, and he says, when you... When you say unto this mountain, he was pointing at it. Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it will obey you. From the time that Jesus said that to now, there's not been one single person that was taken a mountain by what they've said and thrown it into the ocean. So what does that tell you? That the literal interpretation of that is not what he, what he meant. There's, there's a spiritual significance behind that. Okay. And uh, if you read the context, you'll find that out. So there's different ways that we look at things and we qualify things. In uh, the, content, the context principle can be used to solve problems and apparent discrepancies in the Bible. There seems to be sometimes cons 
you know, like a a um, a um, obscure or a confusion about a scripture or a discrepancy about a scripture because you read in one place it says one thing, you read, read another place it says another thing. Like uh, give you an example of the angels at the tomb of Jesus when Mary and, and Peter and them ran to the one account, I, I forget which one in the gospel says that uh, there was one angel. And then another one says that there was two angels. So right away people will say, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. One person said one angel, one person said two. Well, there's a very, very good explanation for that. Okay. Uh, let's say one was Luke and one was Matthew, or one was Mark, whatever. I don't remember exactly, but I'm just doing this from memory now. But I know one of them said that there was only one angel, and one of them said there was two, so who's right? Who's right? Both. Okay, because Luke wrote about what he saw, he saw one. And Matthew wrote what he saw, he saw two. So the revelation to him was two, and the revelation to him was one. And it's not a contradiction, because they both saw it. And you have to take what was said at that tomb. Both said the same thing. They gave the same message. What was that? He is not here, but he has risen. So whether you have one angel saying it or two angels saying it, the main factor of what was being said, the principle of what was being said, was established. So there's no contradiction. Now, if one angel said uh, his disciples came and took him, and the other one said he was erased from the dead, now we have a contradiction. Okay? Because we got one saying that he was resurrected, and another one saying, no, 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 no. You know, his disciples came and took him. But that's not what happened. Okay. So you can see sometimes in these discrepancies that are these apparent discrepancies, I should say, that they're not really discrepancies at all. I'll give you another example. In Genesis 35, 2, it raises the question as to whether Jacob and his house were worshiping idols. Okay? And the answer is to be found in the context of Genesis 31, 25 to 35, and Genesis 34, 26 to 29, where we find that the idols had been kept as family heirlooms rather than just objects of worship. Okay? <clears throat> now, the, uh, that's one explanation. Um, but as further revelation goes on, you know, sometimes it's like um, a person gets saved, right? And they hold on to things that they don't know is wrong. And sometimes some people, when they get saved, they get rid of everything. Okay? They, just, they just get rid of everything. Okay? Uh, I remember Linda, when she first got saved, uh, she, she told me she got rid of a lot of clothing that was provocatively she would have. As, as a person in the world, she got rid of that stuff. Okay, and then she cut her hair. For whatever reason, I don't know, but she cut her hair. I guess she felt dirty or she needed to get cleansed or whatever. I, I don't know what the, I didn't know her at that time she did that. I met her after that. But again, uh, what happens is, is as revelation begins to unfold and God begins to speak to you, like some Christians, they come to Christ and they still smoke cigarettes. Or some of them still drink. What happens is God, only God can, can give you that revelation, okay, that those things are defiling the temple. And so, again, or, you know, uh, you might think, okay, well, you know what? I can be a Christian and I can still drink. Well, okay. What do you do with the Bible that says if your brother stumbles at what you do, don't do it? See, now that person may not be at that place yet where that, God has worked that into their spirit or into their heart. Paul says, if, if I won't do anything that offends my brother, well, I'm not going to do it. Because the, greater, the greatest thing of ever, anything is not so much you having your way or doing what you want, but it's putting others first, right? And so, again, those things need to be looked at. So sometimes in Revelation, uh, somebody may not get that revelation right away. Okay? Sometimes you have to wait, and God will reveal it to you at the time you're spiritually able to receive that. Because we're not all at the same level. Some of us are at different levels. Right? I mean, some, and so somewhat, and so what happens sometimes is those of us that are, have already passed those levels, sometimes we get impatient with those who haven't caught up yet. 
And so we have to be careful because they can't see it. They don't see it yet. A lot of times they will see it when, it when it's too late. Like our friend Rosie when I told her about cigarette smoking. You know, and I'm sure she had an attitude of who do you think you are to tell me? Okay, I'm just telling you what God told me to tell you. Okay, and then shortly, it wasn't, wasn't many years after that, she got cancer and she died of cancer. Again, some people see it, some people don't. You know, some people look beyond who's speaking and say, okay, God, you're speaking to me. You're trying to reveal something to me. So again, make sure that when you see something in the Bible, if you come up with what seems to be a discrepancy or seems to be a contradiction, that you, you investigate it even further and you'll find out that it wasn't. Okay, in Genesis 37, 25 and 28 and 36 and chapter 39, verse 1, presents it to appear a discrepancy in confusing the Ishmaelites with Midianites. And the solution to this is found in the context of, of Genesis 16, 11, 12, and 25, 1 and 2, where we find that Ishmael and Midian were half-brothers and settled in the same country. So you see, there's always an explanation. you just got to look for it and find it. That's why it's a study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Amen? And then this is, one of, this is uh, pretty one of my favorite ones that I looked at. Uh, Jeremiah 22.4 and 34.3. Uh, they seem to contradict Ezekiel 12.13. And I'll give you the example. It says, how could Zedekiah go to Babylon, see the king of Babylon, yet not see Babylon. So in one scripture it says that he didn't see Babylon, and another scripture says he saw the king when he was in Babylon. So how can, how do you, how can you reconcile that discrepancy? Well, it's very simple. The answer is found in 2 Kings 25, 6, and 7, where the fulfillment of these prophecies is reconciled. Zedekiah saw the king of Babylon in Jerusalem, but his eyes were pulled out, were plucked out, and then was taken captive to Babylon. So he never saw Babylon, even though he was in Babylon. Okay? But you see the contradiction that could be there? Wow, I'm reading this. It says, he said the king saw him in Babylon, and the other one, he didn't see Babylon? How can you be in Babylon seeing the king if he was never in Babylon? So the devil will take that and kind of twist it in your head and say, see, there's contradictions. You can't trust the word. No, the word will, will eventually unfold itself if you study it to show yourself a proof. Amen? To a certain extent, the use of the context principle enables us to determine the application of Scripture to those specifics of life that Scripture has not specifically treated. Okay, to give you an example <clears throat> or a demonstration. Hebrews 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. So if we consider this verse in the light of its fourfold context, the passage context here in Hebrews 10, 19 to 12, chapters 12, 2. The subject matter of this passage is faith. And this is the key word in the passage. It's used 27 times. Okay, so the subject is introduced in 10, chapter 10, verse 19 to 22 with an uh, exhortation to draw near to God with full assurance of faith in the blood of Jesus, our high priest who has made a way for, us, for our entrance. Then in verse 23 to 29, follow with an exhortation to maintain the profession of faith and with, uh, with a warning against wavering or drawing back to unbelief. <clears throat> but what is faith? And when we say what is faith, we all, we all have the uh, verse memorized. And, yeah, we all have that verse memorized. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Okay. But what is faith? What is the faith? What is faith? Believing? It, it has a little bit to do with believing, but believing can be different than faith because the devils believe and tremble. So and the devil, we know the devils are not saved. Demons are not saved. Uh, saving faith, what is that? Okay, is faith action? 
Okay. But what is faith? Faith is the things hoped for. Faith is the evidence. Yeah. Faith is trusting in God, right? Right. But when you have faith, you have to have faith in someone. Right? You can have faith that when you sit down in that chair, it's not going to crumble underneath you. Right? And you take that for granted every day. You just sit in your chair and you think that chair is going to hold you up all or you get in your car and you, you think, you know, when you turn that key, it's going to start. And hopefully it does. <laughs> okay. That, that way you could apply the scripture, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for. <laughs> you have faith that you believe that car is going to turn over. Okay. But when you have faith, you have faith in a person. Okay. Faith is, is having, uh, having a trust in a person for what they have done you. So when I say uh, I have faith uh, in this particular uh, portion of scripture when it talks about in Hebrews about faith, it's faith in God and what he has done. Now when you receive what God has done and you receive what God has said okay, then God because of who he is expects obedience. I heard the other day, partial obedience is really rebellion. Think about it. So he wants us to be obedient, right? So what's going to happen? When you have faith and God begins to, to work in you, okay, and we understand that we're saved by faith, you know, we are saved by grace through faith. But that's through a person. Amen? I'm not saved because of my faith. In other words, my Savior is not faith. My Savior is Jesus Christ. And I put my faith in Him for what He has done. I put my trust in Him for what He has done for me. And He has saved me. He has sanctified me. He has justified me. He has filled me with His Spirit. All of those things that the scripture says, but with those things that God does, He expects you and I to be obedient. That's why He says, faith without works is dead. A person can say they have all the faith in the world, but if they don't have works, they don't have faith. They don't have faith in God and what He said and what He's doing and how He's, he's working in your life. He that hath begun a good work in you shall complete it. And having all of those things that he starts to do. If you have dead faith where you're not doing anything that God is required of you or allowing God to do in your life, your faith is dead. It's not working. There's no living. Faith is living. It's not dead. It's a living faith. It's a living hope. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. So when you read the scriptures that it says faith without works is dead, Yes, that's true. But it's not the works that you generate. See, the works that are apart from salvation is works according to the flesh. And those works don't, don't, don't matter to God. It's the works that you allow Him to do in you. To give you an example, you're home, you put the television on. You're watching a movie. It's a great movie. Okay? It's a great movie. Okay? But in the middle of the movie, there's a real seducing scene. Okay? I won't have to explain anymore. We're all adults. We understand what that means. Okay? Now, the Holy Spirit in you says, turn it off. Do you still watch it? 
Now you have a chance. Here's, a, here's, here's your faith being put to a test. Okay, into works. Are you going to obey what God says? Or are you going to continue watching? And if you continue watching it, then what ends up happening is you're walking in disobedience, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Come on. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit, okay, He is going to convict you of not only watching what you're watching, but he's going to convict you of grieving him. So again, we got to look at this again. I'm, we're not going to. I don't, don't want to get into chapter seven. Maybe I can. I don't know. But let's, let's see. Let's look for a moment, when you take a scripture, and I like what Brother Bob Bautiz said, you've got to look at the scripture before it, you've got to look at the scripture after it, but you also have to look at that subject, what was, it, what was said about that subject before in other books, in other places. And in chapter 7, that's what we're going to get to next week is the first mention principle. We'll get into that next week. But I, I just want to touch a little bit about, about the, the context, because sometimes when you read something, um, I can give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine who's a minister, okay, reads Matthew 24 and says, see, that proves we're going to be here for the tribulation. And he says, when you see these things, flee to Judea. So I said to him, I'll say, okay, so in the context of what you're reading and you're telling me that the church is going to be here, you need to justify that. You need to, you need to explain that to me in Matthew 24. And so I, he said to me, well, he says, it's, it just says it right there that when you see these things, okay. So my question to him was, so you're saying that's talking to Christians? And he says, yes. He says, the word of God, of course, is talking to Christians. So I says, well, then you have to explain to me when he says, then flee to Judea, then that means that you have to get on a plane and go there. Right? He says, when you see these things, flee to Judea. So then you have to get on a plane and go there. And he said, well, no. And I said, okay, so if you're saying no now, let's examine who was he speaking to at the time. He was talking to the Israel. He was talking to Israel. He was talking to the believers that are alive at that time. Now, we believe the church is gone already. Okay? So the believers at that time that are alive are the Jews. He said, when you see these things, the abomination of desolation, okay, sitting in the holy place. Wait a minute, let's stop for a minute. Sitting in the holy place. So that means that the temple has to be rebuilt. Okay? Do you know that they've just found out that where they thought the temple was supposed to be is not where it's supposed to be. That right now they have empty space right there where the wall is. I believe it's the that's the eastern gate, that's the western gate. No, I think it's the north gate. The north gate, the north gate, right on that wall there. They have plenty of space to put the to reconstruct the temple. So. When you interpret the scriptures, you have to take in consideration the cultural context. Why was he speaking these things? To whom was he speaking these things? When was he speaking these things? How did he speak to them? How, what was the tone? Was he, was he angry? Was, he, was it a discussion? All of these things you have to take in consideration. 
to get the proper biblical interpretation. Otherwise, you'll run off, you know, half uh, ready to say, okay, we're going to go through the tribulation period. So I asked him the question. I said, so if you're talking to Christians, when did, he, when did he switch from talking to them to us? And he said, wow, I never thought of that. So you have to think of that. When did he switch from talking to them to talking to us? I said, he, ha he, he hasn't. He still was talking to them. He says, well, how do you know that? I said, I know that because that's the narrative of who he was talking with. Okay? That he, that we weren't around. He was talking, the Gentiles weren't there, he was talking to the Jews, and he was telling them, when you see these signs that are going to take place, he says, then flee to Judea. And they're in, the, they're in the geographical location, it's easy for them to do that. And so that's how you make sure you interpret the Word of God correctly in the context principle and through the cultural principle. And it's very important. Also is the uh, Testament context. You have to find out, you know, if it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, are there principles that still apply in the New Testament? Or is it just an Old Testament principle that no longer exists for us? Like the sacrificial animals. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. Okay. Um, keeping the holy days, the festivals, the festival of lights, the uh, festival of first fruits, the Passover, Hanukkah, all, all of those Jewish festivals. Uh, we don't have to keep those. But there's a segment of Christianity today, you know it, there's churches out there, they wear the yarmulkes, they wear the shawls when they pray, and they say, you have to do this, if you don't do this, you're not saved. I had one person tell me one time, if I don't wear a shawl, and I, uh, wear a, uh, a Jewish shawl and, and a yarmulke on my head, God doesn't hear my prayer. So I guess the, the guy at the cross, when he prayed, be merciful to me, you know, Lord, you know. He didn't have a yarmulke on. He didn't have a shawl on. So again, th those things can be easily bunked. I don't have to become Jewish to be accepted by God. In fact, the Bible says, woe to them who say they are Jews and they are not. We are not Jews. We are Gentiles. But we have been grafted in to the one who is Jewish. We have been adopted. Okay, Now if I adopt a Chinese baby, he's not going to be American. He's not going to be French and Portuguese. You're not going to change his ethnicity. He's going to be the same. But he's still adopted. But he's still a part of the family. You, you follow what I'm saying? So again... Uh, sometimes you'll see these, or you'll see people um, say that. Um, what's the other one that they say uh, about women with long hair? W women should not cut their hair; should not have short hair. They should have long hair because it's a covering for them. Okay, uh, I think that's in Corinthians, isn't it? Somewhere, I think it's in Corinthians somewhere about a woman should not cut her hair, should shave her hair because it's a covering for her. It's her glory. And, and a lot of denominations, the holiness movement, they say if you wear jewelry and earrings and you wear a ring, your wedding rings and all that stuff, that, that, that's not of God and that's, that's, you need to get rid of that stuff. And that's not what the Bible says. If you read, in, in, I think it's in Corinthians, where it talks about a, a woman that has long hair. But if you continue reading down two or three more verses after that, it, Paul says this, but for as us, we have no such custom in the church. Hello? Okay. He says it right in the context. But we have no such custom in the church. You can get so caught up in legalism 
you know, and that doesn't mean that you allow sin. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about just legalistic things like the Sabbath. You've got to keep the Sabbath. Okay? Well, what was the Sabbath distance you could travel? Like a mile and a half, that was it? A mile and, and eight-tenths of a mile? One mile and eight-tenths? I think I forget exactly the exact number of uh, miles you could go. But let's say two miles, just for the sake of argument. Let's say two miles. If you live two, way, two miles away from church, you can't, you can't come to church. You have to observe the Sabbath. Okay. Um, you can't do certain things. You can't cook. You can't press an elevator button because that's work. Can't do any. Of it. Yeah, you're laughing, but that's the truth. When we were in Israel, okay, right, hon? When we were in Israel, when uh, Friday at sundown started the Sabbath, all of the elevators go on automatic. Okay, so you don't have to push a button. And what it does is it stops at every floor. Okay, and, and then you just walk in, you get in, and you have to go all the way up to the top, and then you have to come all the way back down again. Okay. Okay, because you can't touch the buttons. Okay, and we laugh at that, but you know what? That's their tradition. That's what they do. Okay. But they still get in their car and they still drive two, three, four miles, and they break the Sabbath. Just like, I think, Seventh-day Adventists, they're so stuck on Saturday. That it's going to be a Saturday, and if you're not observing it, you're breaking the law, and you're, you know, God is against you, he's going to strike you dead, and all this other stuff. You know? uh, that's an exaggeration. But, you know, they, they, they really put you down if you don't believe, you know, believe in the Sabbath. My point is this. I say, to them, how far do you live from the church? Well, I live about 10 miles. Well, you just broke the Sabbath. See, they just don't see that. But the Sabbath is so many rules and regulations. But Jesus said, the Sabbath wasn't made for man, but man. You know, what did he say? It wasn't made for man, but man for the Sabbath. It's a day of rest for you. God said that he made the seventh day holy so that you could spend it with him and that you could rest from your six days of labor. Six days men shall labor, but on the seventh day they shall rest. That's a rest. It's, it has nothing to do with uh, the religious aspect of, of making it so so uh, uh, legalistic. So again, these are some of the things, some of the principles that God's word that you have to read for yourself and find out for yourself that, you know, when pe people try to put that stuff on you, just like in the Bible when they said, okay, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You know, the man, no, no. No, that's a work of the, of the flesh. No, I don't have to do that to be saved. Okay. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look a certain way. Now, again, there was a girl that came to our church, and this was when we were in the other building, and um, let me put this in here so I don't forget where we're gonna leave off. And um, she came in, dressed kind of tight. I'll put it that way. Okay. In all places. And someone came up to me in the church, I'm not going to say who, someone came up to me in the church and said, Pastor, you have to address that. It was a male, of course. So you have to address that. And I said, no, no, I don't. Well, then do you approve of that kind of dress? And I said, no. I said, it's not my place to tell her. Tell her. Well, you're the pastor. What does the Bible say? Huh? The, to dress modestly? To live soberly? That's your job. Okay? And I told, I told the brother, I said, well, if it bothers you that much and you keep looking at it all, all the time it comes through the door, why don't you sit in the front? That will solve your whole problem. Sit in the front. Well, come to find out, make a long story short, that person wrote me a letter, and she, and she told me, she said, um, how I ended up coming to your church was that I was I already made up my mind that I was going to commit suicide. 
And she said, um, but I remember Priscilla had taken me to your church one time. She says, I didn't know what the name of it was again, but I remembered where it was, and, and so I came in. And she said, I was part of a church that ridiculed me, laughed at me, mocked me, uh, didn't want to have anything to do with me, wouldn't talk to me because of the way I dress. Now, can you imagine if I would have addressed that issue? She probably would have gone out and killed herself. She was going to kill herself. And she said, I just want to thank you for accepting me and loving me. And eventually she changed. You know, she started dressing different. Again, see, people get so legalistic about things. Okay? I see more Christians that dress right and look right on the outside but they're not right on the inside. They come to church, they come to every service, but they're not right on the inside. I, I, I just don't understand how people, even Christians, participate in Halloween. How can they do that? How can you have any participation in Halloween when it's, the, it's, the, it, it's, it's even in satanic books that it's, it's, it's Lucifer's high holy day. Why would you want to participate and even associate with people that are participating in that and, and like your approval of that? As a Christian, there's no conviction? Hello? I'm listening to the crickets. You know why? Because we have been ingrained with socially acceptable. It's acceptable. It's just for the kids. It really doesn't mean what it meant. But it still meant that. You want to know why there's so many personality disorders all over the place? Why so many people are on all kinds of drugs and mental drugs and all kinds of pe mental people running around? Everyone's trying to be somebody that they're not. Think about it. They're dressing up as another person. They're dressing up on somebody else. Who, do you want, who are you going to be? Who are you going to dress up like? Think about it. From the time they're real little, we put these costumes on them, especially the witch costumes. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand that. Christians! Christians dressing their kids up in witch co uh, costumes. What's wrong with that picture? Ooh, you're inviting in the powers of darkness to take over that child and that person. You know why we have so many personality disorders? No wonder people don't know whether they're a male or a female anymore. It's the truth. But that's because the church is not doing what it's supposed to do. And as I talked to this couple today, I told them, I said, listen. I said, I can understand sometimes when you get turned off from Christianity because of what you see out there. But I said, we always remember this one thing. If you don't remember anything else, I tell you. I said, what's that? I said, whenever you have a counterfeit, you have an original. Because the original, uh, the counterfeit is just a reproduction of what's real. If you have a counterfeit dollar bill or a counterfeit $20 bill, it had to copy it from somewhere. It had to copy it from the original. And it looks almost like a real one except it's, it's a copy. Where did they get it? They try to get it as close to the original as possible. That's what Satan does. And he's done that with the word. He gets the word twisted. He did that with Eve. God didn't mean it that way. Eve, you took it wrong. God wasn't trying to do that. What he was trying to do is hold back something from you. Because he knows in the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge, you're going to be just like God. And isn't that the, the thing of mankind today? They want to be like God. you got Oprah Winfrey telling everybody that we're, we're gods. you got all the New Age people telling us we're gods. Can I tell you something? That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Think about it. I have a hard enough time being who I am, never mind being God. It's the truth, isn't it? So in the same way that the enemy has tried to twist God's word and, 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 and 
wrestle the scriptures and twist them to mean things that they don't mean, he's still doing that today. And how he does that is he takes the scripture or what God says, like he said to Eve, and he twists it, or he adds to it. Remember, exegesis is exiting out the meaning. Eisegesis is putting your thoughts into it and what you think it means. That's exactly what the devil said. And Eve did the same thing. God never said anything about touching it. Right? When God told Adam, he says, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat it out thereof, you shall die. He said nothing about touching it. But when, when the serpent was talking to Eve, she said, we can't eat it or touch it. He said, no, that's not true. God's keeping something from you. See, he's adding to the word. He said that the day that you eat it, he knows that the day you eat, you'll become like him. Don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be like God? Right? Don't we want to be like Jesus? Yeah, we all want to be like Jesus. We want to emulate him, but we're not him. We're not little Jesuses all walking around. Don't. That's part of false teaching. We're not little Jesus. We're not little gods. We can't speak in things into existence. But people all over the world, even in Africa, even in Nigeria, they believe that they can speak things into existence. Again, out of context scripture, to say that this mountain be thou removed, and you shall have whatever you say. So I asked him, I said, where's that in the Bible? He says, I don't know, but that's what preachers say. I don't care what preachers say. I want to know what's in the Bible. You can't create a flea to be an elephant. Try it sometime. Get a flea, put him in a jar, and say, you're an elephant. I create you to be an elephant. Why won't that work? That's exactly right. He created everything after its own kind. That's why we're not for monkeys. I don't care what college professor, I don't care what university, I don't care if it's Harvard or Yale or Princeton or any other prestigious Ivy League school that comes along and tells you that we come from monkeys. That is so stupid. It doesn't make any sense. You see me walking over, dragging my knuckles on the ground? No. And again, context. It's all about context. Keeping things in perspective. Historically, culturally, biblically, all of those things in interpreting the scriptures. So next week we're going to get into the principle, um, the principle of first mention. With some good, good examples about that. How that when something is mentioned in the Bible usually stays true all the way through. Amen? Praise God. Any questions? We're going to be signing off from Facebook. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. God bless.